Hey everyone, I'm Ashley of Van Cosplay. Today I'm gonna be showing you how to make this bad boy. Can't believe it's not another Fortnite video. This is my absolute favorite cosplay of mine, and it's kind of shown over the test of time. It's gotten a little bit beat up, but I've been meaning to do a walkthrough for a very long time. I actually wanted to build a new arm that would fit me a little bit better. As you can see, after two years, you know, your body changes shape, your muscles are a little different. It doesn't fit me quite like it used to. Unfortunately, the Midwest weather has not been cooperating, and this involves a lot of spray painting outdoors, so I'm gonna do the next best thing and walk you through every step I took to make this, including some progress photos, which are a little hilarious. And I'll show you all the supplies I used along the way and everything I did to make this extra smooth and extra shiny. Let's get into it. I'm just gonna tell myself I got really buff and that's why it no longer fits my bicep. Oh my God. Wait, <laughs> look at this profesh setup. I look like a real gamer or something. I see the thing people do where they put like photos of videos right here. So here's hoping I know enough in Premiere to be able to do that. It looks good so far. We'll see. <laughs> so the first step in most cosplays that involve pieces of foam or foam armor is that you need to make a cast of that part of your body to then create your pattern. For my Winter Soldier cosplay, obviously I had to make a cast of my left arm. Usually it's so much easier when you have somebody to help you, but no one is ever here to help me nor willing to help me. But I managed to do this myself. It was totally fine. I just had to kind of go slow and I did do it twice to make sure it was the snugness I wanted. I will say it is a good idea for this arm. I wore a long sleeve shirt as I did it. That way it kind of added some extra bulk in there and it wouldn't be too tight at least until, you know, I got buffered. I'll link some videos below and within the video that were kind of my basis for learning how to do this. But the way you do this is by taking saran wrap, like cling wrap, and wrapping it all around your body part. Body, that sounded so weird. Wrap it around your arm. <laughs> After you have your layer of cling wrap, you'll then go over with duct tape or masking tape. I preferred masking tape for this because it's- <gasps> Gabe! <laughs> Are you gonna help me? Okay, Gaber. Anyway, I preferred like masking tape or drafting tape, something that was lighter in color because I am going to be drawing all the segments on it for my pattern later. So the lighter the color, easier to draw. Because I built my arm in two parts, which I guess there's really not a way around that, I just left the middle elbow part out. That way I was, I mean, I was doing this myself. That way I was able to still bend my arm while trying to get it in position. I found what was most successful for me is I really wanted to extend the shape on the shoulder. It didn't just stop right here at the tip of my shoulder I made sure I brought some of that material over kind of onto my chest a little bit and that way you also avoid having your skin kind of show a little bit around where your top will cut off so once you have the duct tape or drafting tape in place that's where you're gonna sketch out approximately where you're gonna want the shape of your arm to be like I brought my duct tape over onto my chest and just in places where I didn't really want my arm to go towards so I marked off how far I wanted to extend on my shoulder I marked off the elbow piece and the forearm piece as well as my wrist in a place that I thought would be comfortable then I went ahead and cut the whole thing off of my arm, just kind of cutting down a seam that I made down the middle. Then once it was off my body, I cut off the shapes and then this was going to become the pattern for the base of the arm. Now to turn this piece of duct tape and cling wrap into an actual pattern, the goal is that you want to cut darts into the curved pieces of it to get it to lay flat. Your end goal is to get this cast of your arm to lay flat where you can trace that and have that actually be your pattern. So you'll see in the images that I actually made darts in the shoulders and I think I also cut it in half right at the bicep because it was able to like help me give a little bit more of a shape but it wasn't just like a tube on my arm so basically anywhere there's curves you just want to cut into it make some darts once the piece lays flat you're good and it might look a little funky because you're gonna have little pieces jutting off of it but once everything's glued together taped together it's gonna look cool an important step that I totally failed to do last time I did this was to then take that flat piece and transfer that pattern onto a piece of paper that you can actually keep. I did not do that, so I don't even have the pattern for the base of my arm, which is fine anyway. I'm going to have to remake it soon, so I do a really bad job at making my own patterns and saving them for future use. So yes, be sure to trace that down because you're going to actually be putting the arm together, that cast you made. We're going to put that together and then use that for all the segments. At this point, I tape both the bicep and the forearm pieces back together. So now is when I actually, this kind of becomes a little bit of a puzzle piece, but I looked at several references that I kind of liked and I actually simplified my pattern a little bit because I don't know <laughs> it's a lot of work and also no one's gonna knock you for not having every single detail and if they do then 
that's on them. Basically, I looked at a couple reference photos and different sketches, and I held my piece in front of me and just drew those shapes and segments right onto that cast I had. And then I kind of looked at that, worked on it until I was satisfied. Something I found really helpful, especially for like the big forearm shoulder piece, is I found like one point of interest, like there's a weird little like diamond shape right here. I started there and then I was able to kind of work out from that shape and get it all to fit how I wanted. It really helps to start from one point and work out from it, otherwise it's kind of overwhelming at first. So now that I had the segments all drawn out and I was happy with them, I did not cut yet. I actually had the foresight to go ahead and number them, either going from like the wrist up or the top of the shoulder down. That way when I cut it all apart, I knew exactly what order it would go in. Otherwise, some of them look the same, but they're a little longer. Just number them. That way it'll go together so much easier. <laughs> then you can go ahead and cut out the segment pieces. You can actually transfer those to paper too, like the base of the arm, but you know, because I don't transfer my patterns, I just use those tape pieces as my pattern. I actually still have them saved in my drawer, so that was something that worked well. But you could go ahead and put them on paper if you want something a little bit easier to trace, but the tape honestly works just fine with less work. Now that all the patterns are ready, I went ahead and traced everything on a two millimeter foam. Two millimeter foam might seem a little thin, but because it's double layered, I mean, you know, two plus two equals four, I did find that it's still decently rigid. It is a delicate piece, but this is plenty of foam. I can't imagine going much thicker. I thought about using four millimeter foam as a base, but I think it would have just been way too clunky. So I preferred to use two millimeter for the base and all the segments on top. Once everything was traced on the two millimeter foam, mi millimeter foam, then I went ahead and started assembling. You can kind of see a little bit how the base of my arm worked. You can still see the darts on the inside here. I had a couple around the shoulder. Um, it might be hard to see, but you can see here where I actually cut this in half. That's because I'm, it made it easier to get like this curve in here. And it's very subtle, but there's a little bit of like a bicep curve here. So that's just how I ended up cutting my pattern to make it work. And then what I did to glue all my foam together was use the trusty dusty contact cement. Now the next part with the segments is a little bit of a puzzle and a little bit time consuming. So I began kind of laying out all my segments starting from one end or going to the other. What I did was I took the piece, laid it on top, and I kind of like rolled up my masking tape and just stuck it on. So none of these were permanently attached. I just wanted to see how it laid out in case I needed to make adjustments. So I taped all the pieces on and then when they were in a position I was happy with, I went in with a Sharpie and like kind of got in here and traced where all the different segments were. Then I could take them off, contact them at them, pop them on exactly where I traced it and I knew exactly how it was gonna come out and nothing would be out of line or something ends up messed up and not lining up. Question I've gotten quite a bit and it's something like, I mean, I'm glad I get the question because it makes me feel good, is how I made these so smooth and so shiny. The key to the really shiny finish is to have a super smooth base. And the way I did that was with Mod Podge. Mod Podge, I don't typically use to seal foam because it does crack. It's pretty delicate, but the end result for this is totally worth it. I did five layers of Mod Podge on every piece and I let it dry completely in between each layer. The reason that I wanted so many layers is because I did a lot of sanding. If I didn't have enough Mod Podge there, I would just sand right through it and back down to the foam. So five layers seemed to be the golden number. After the five layers of Mod Podge was done, I needed to sand it. So for sanding, I found these on Amazon. It's a huge stack of various grits of sandpaper and they're labeled on the back and everything. All I do is I tear a piece off kind of like that. And you can see that I actually, I labeled it 600. So I knew what this grit was. It's totally worn down to like nothing now, but this is a really good tool. They're not very expensive. What I did is I used the sandpaper to wet sand. I used somewhere in the realm of 400 grit sandpaper to wet sand. You want something with a little bit of grit, but you don't want anything that'll just tear it apart. So to wet sand, what I did was I ripped off a piece that I wanted to use. We'll pretend this piece is not absolutely beat up. I took my scrap little cup for water, fill it with water, you just dip your sandpaper right in there, and then you just take the sopping sandpaper and rub it in circular motions on the foam. Because of the Mod Podge, it'll kind of start to look cloudy and almost like bubble up a little bit. I don't want to say bubble up. It looks like soap almost as you're kind of sanding it in a circular motion. But as I did that, I would just kind of wipe up the excess water with some paper towel, let it dry a little bit, and I kind of went back in with it. I just like sanded it until I was happy with it. I can't remember how many rounds I did, but but usually like two or three passes sanding was enough to get it nice and smooth. To make sure it was like as absolutely smooth as could possibly be, the first thing I sprayed it with was this fillable 
what? Pillar and sandable primer. This is the two-in-one version, but I've also just used like the filler primer too. I didn't really notice a difference. So after you do a heavy coat of this on there and let it dry, you can obviously actually sand it. You'll see in the photo that I didn't need to sand it. And I think it's just because I did like some good legwork sanding it after the Mod Podge. But if you find that there's still like bubbles or like holes or something you wanna fix, you can actually sand this. You can go back with another coat of this after you sand it, but you could also just be ready to move to the next step. The second key to a super shiny finish is a great gloss black layer. The Shinier and smoother your layer of gloss black is, the better result you're gonna have with the chrome paint. So this is just a Krylon gloss black. I didn't really find any difference in paint brands. Any gloss black is perfect. So now that everything is super smooth, it's super glossy, it's the gloss black, this is the best chrome paint I have ever encountered in my life. This paint is called Spaz Sticks and it's available in Mirror Chrome and several other colors. Obviously, I used the Mirror Chrome and later on I used the Candy Apple Red for the star. You don't want to go super heavy handed with this at first. I do two really light coats. I stand pretty far back from it, just do a light pass, letting it dry completely in between. And then you do a third and final coat that's a little bit heavier and is going to give you your final chrome end result. Because it's somehow still not shiny enough for me at the very end, and it's something I could go back and do this arm now, I use a, well, clean, not a dirty one. I use a clean, soft microfiber cloth, and I just kind of buff out the chrome paint very gently gently, but it's just enough to kind of give it that extra shine that makes it really, really nice. Something that's super important to note is that you do not want to put any clear coat or anything like that on top of this paint. It immediately dulls the paint and it sometimes even yellows it or gives it like a purple tint. It just, you can't put a top coat on this, which is one con to it, but as long as you're careful with your stuff, you can always touch up the paint. Don't put a top coat on. I cannot find this marker and I have three of them, <laughs> but my secret weapon for touch-ups on my chrome paint jobs is that I use a, oh my God, I need to check the name. I believe it's pronounced Molotow Liquid Chrome. It's a little paint pen looking marker that I actually got on Amazon. It gives you this super chrome shiny paint. You, it's hard to paint anything like large with it, but it's perfect for touch-ups. And as I crack the arm or even on the edges, I just take that paint pen and it it touches it up, it's super shiny and works really well. After all that work, I was a little scared to add the red star, but I made a little template for myself with some paper and I wrapped the rest of the arm in plastic to make sure I didn't ruin it. And I used just a couple light coats of this and then the last final coat and I have a nice equally shiny red star on top. Because I made my arm so perfectly fit to my body at the time, I didn't really need crazy attachments to keep it in place. The only thing that's definitely key is having a piece in the shoulder that can wrap around around your chest, come up over your old uh, the other shoulder, and then attach in the front here, and then it keeps it nice and like taut on your shoulder. So what I have here in the back of my arm, this is the piece that faces the back here. I have this elastic permanently attached to my arm. What I do for elastic to attach it to foam is I first sew the elastic to a piece of webbing or a piece of fabric that has no stretch. That way I could glue that to the foam because if this is constantly stretching on the glue, it's just gonna tear it off. And then to attach that stationary piece, I scored the inside of my foam with my blade, loaded it up with hot glue, obviously, and then stuck that piece of webbing on there. And this is, I've never had any issues with it. It's not popped off. So fingers crossed. So let's see if I could do this on my own. So kind of similar thing in the front, except this is a piece of Velcro. Um, I just scored the foam again and then used a lot of hot glue underneath and on top to keep it in place. So I put it on. We'll pretend, you know, it goes under my like missing sleeve shirt here. And then I got the piece in the back. It wraps around, comes up. I have it come across my chest this way and then it goes in here, attaches to the Velcro and that keeps it like, it pulls it nice and tight and flush on my shoulder. So it's not gonna move. Cause I made my arm in two pieces so I can bend my arm, you know, a little bit. I just have this sleeve made out of a like chrome colored, um, what you might call it, like spandex fabric. It's not even constructed that well. It's just stitched with like raw edges. It's just something that slides underneath here. And then when I put the pieces on, it blends in pretty well with the color of my arm. So for the hand, I kind of did something 
different. These are actually Iron Man fingers. To paint these 3D printed fingers, I did exactly what I did for the rest of the arm where I used the sandable filler primer, the gloss black, and the same chrome paint on them. And then I just have this fingerless leather black glove that goes right over top of it. As you can see in the photos, it looks like a pretty cool robotic hand. And that's pretty much it. Of course, it's a lot easier said than done, but it's not too bad of a process. A lot of the time is spent drafting out the pattern, drawing all the segments, and of course, sanding, but it goes pretty fast and it looks super cool in the end to have an arm that fits you just right. Hopefully one day soon I'll get to making a new arm and filming that, but for now I hope this helped you and I can't wait to see you guys next time.